Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD for September 11th, 2019. I'm your host, Arusha Paris, and with me today is Evan Harvey, Global Head of Sustainability at NASDAQ. Thanks for being here, Evan. My uh, pleasure. Thank you for having me. On today's podcast, for the first two segments, Evan and I are going to talk about ESG ratings and how they can help you in your stock analysis. Then for the third segment, we'll have Justin Nielsen, Director of Research at IBD, join us again on the podcast, and Justin and I will talk about the current market and current stocks. And so let's get into ESG. And first, Evan, let's let's uh, define what ESG is for everyone out there. Yeah, ESG is sort of the latest iteration of what started as socially conscious investing or strategic and impact investing. Those were investment styles that targeted a specific social environmental outcome, often led by small investors that had a very specific agenda in mind. ESG is sort of the evolutionary phase that we're in now that is looking at data points that actually illustrate the environmental, social, and corporate governance performance of companies. Because a lot of investors and a lot of other people feel like those performance factors across the E, S, and G space are indicators of a well-run company, an excellent management style, and returns over the long term. And so, so now, well, let me take a step back from that. And how did you become involved, uh, first in investing or, or even just this topic? Because you've developed quite an expertise in this. Well, the exchange has been involved uh, for many years. I, I got in, I've been at NASDAQ for 15 years, and the exchange has been finding ways to create more transparency and efficiency and transactional um, fluidity between buyers and sellers. So to us, ESG data is just another aspect of that uh, responsible market stewardship. Um, getting more information from companies into the hands of investors so that they can make smart decisions. Mm -hmm. And then also in the process, making the companies a little bit uh, better run, uh, making them more appealing to people that might want to work there, making them more uh, uh, resilient to risk, and especially not only organizational and legal risk, but the kind of risks that are incumbent in the ESG movement itself, specifically climate risks. And and now with all of this data and, and this growth of this ESG data, how, how is it reported? Do companies self-report this or are there analysts out there that, that are collecting this data? All of the above. Okay. There are analysts that collect the data. There are analysts that do their own independent analysis. There are some uh, markets and venues around the world where reporting by public companies is mandatory and they have to put information into the system to the government or to the exchange. Mm -hmm. In the US, it is largely voluntary. Uh, there are some government governance uh, data points that are required, but generally these are data points that companies voluntarily put into um, places like Bloomberg and ratings and rankings firms because they want to attract investors who have a long-term mindset. And, and so now, how is this affecting the, the investing dynamic, I guess, of, of just the environment out there? Because this is a, it's, it's a really, really interesting rating, and now as more and more people become aware and, and they want to be more socially conscious, uh, and make you know uh, decisions along their kind of moral compass. Uh, yeah, how 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 is this uh, ch is this changing just the investing world a little bit? Or are you seeing a little bit shifts there? It's changing in the sense that you can invest your values and not sacrifice returns. So there used to be this prevailing myth out there that if you were going to invest your values or apply some sort of moral or ethical lens to how you used your money, you were going to sacrifice returns. Right. Uh, it now seems clear that that's not the case. In fact, the opposite may be the case. You might be investing in better companies that have a stronger return over the long term by virtue of them performing in this way and not just on market returns in other ways you know lower investor turnover uh, better recruitment and retention rates uh, better pr and brand value we have we all talk about this intangible valuation of brands and this is one of those aspects of brand valuation that is important to companies what about the stakeholders is it is it now forcing you know beyond just a stock investor or a fund investor well, it's a timely question, as you know. So <laughs> for years and years and years, especially in the U.S., you know, the uh, the, the party line has been that the the uh, you were devoted to the shareholder and the company is fiduciary responsibility to deliver returns for the shareholder. Everything else that it does is sort of above and beyond. Um, 
recently through the business roundtable and other places there have been voices saying that there may be other stakeholders that matter not that the shareholder is not important not even that the shareholder is not still prime in the consideration for management as they consider fiduciary duty but there are other aspects other stakeholders that might have impact on how that company is run society uh, other aspects of employee employee relations, um, legal and, and medical issues. There are all kinds of things that might want to be taken into consideration when a company is making operational decisions. What what about uh, regulation? You know, or how, how's that impacting? I mean, I would think that that's going to raise more costs for the companies themselves. It could. I mean, companies that are doing voluntary reporting, I think, are already set for any regulation that might apply to them. Okay. In the U.S., there's not too much regulation. You know, the SEC has not done too much in terms of forcing companies to disclose ESG if it's not, according to them, materially important enough to put into their financial disclosures. Uh, overseas, in Europe and in Asia in particular, there are more stringent guidelines around uh, public reporting of ESG performance metrics. Uh, large American multinationals that have a presence in Europe and other places, they are being caught up in some of that regulation. So even if they're headquartered in the U.S., they're not necessarily exempt from regulatory pressure on ESG transparency. Now, earlier you mentioned about the rate of return, and 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 uh, now there's a little bit more alignment. There are a lot of these companies with high ESG uh, scores. Their their rate of returns are are pretty good or even better. Now, it, it do you see that correlation increasing, or is there a pretty strong correlation with that? The correlation is strong. We have no idea what the causation is. This okay. could be completely coincidental. Maybe yeah. it's indicative of a well-run company. Maybe the fact that they are performing on ESG means they have a smart management team. They have an inclusive mindset. They're into diversity. They're looking at the diversity of ideas as well as people. So, uh, you know, they use their board in a smarter way as a, as a strategic oversight body. So it could be literally that they are just running their company in a smarter, more data-driven way. Um, or it could be there's something fundamental in ESG performance that that correlates with long-term market returns. Uh, that certainly you would think makes them more risk resilient. You know, if you are aware of how you have flaws in your energy plan, or you're not going to be able to build your product 10 years from now because the literal raw materials will not be available, you would think that that company would be more able to preserve over the long term than a company that was ignoring that fact. Right. Now let, let's talk about it from uh, an institutional versus a retail perspective. Now institutions have been a little bit more, uh, I've been more aware about this, or they've had more data, I guess, uh, in years. But it, how, how does this differ for, uh, from each uh, type of investor? Well, institutions obviously have access to enormous tools. Uh, you know, even the Bloomberg terminal is a tremendous source of information and insight around ESG performance. So, and that's a that's a cost that is beyond the typical retail investor. So there are free tools and calculators out there that can help you sort. I suggest that individual investors that are really interested in finding ESG performing companies look at the top indexes and look at the components that are in those indexes because in a way those companies have been pre-vetted for them. So the companies that are in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index or in the NASDAQ Green Index or in the FTSE for Good Index, those methodologies for index inclusion and for determining those component companies are pretty rigorous. And if you're looking for a shortcut and a free tool, you can start looking at those lists in order to start to evaluate stocks. Perfect. Uh, so ESG ratings are becoming more important to investors, and it can help you narrow down the list of stocks to select from. Let's take a quick break here. But when we return, we're going to talk about a growing industry that is reducing land and water use and also has potential for some high ESG ratings. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Justin Nielsen, Director of Market Research at Investors Business Daily. Want to learn about ETFs? Well, IBD is hosting a free webinar on September 17th full of ETF strategies you can use to profit in any market. Join me and Mike Webster, and you'll learn how to broaden your exposure in bull markets with leveraged and sector ETFs and see ways to hedge in bear markets with volatility and inverse ETFs. Go to Investors.com webinar to sign up today. Evan Harvey, Global Head of Sustainability at NASDAQ, is our guest on Investing with IBD. Okay, Evan, uh, let's first talk about millennials. Everyone's talking about millennials. You see it all out there. How are they uh, reacting to these ESG ratings? Well, I think that they're certainly more willing to invest their values. And when they are owners, vote their values. They are looking to put their money into companies, whatever money they have, that are aligned with their social and moral compass and that are in particular uh, 
uh, environmentally and socially responsible. So I think that's a bit of a transformation in the marketplace as these younger people accumulate more wealth and more capital and they distribute it across markets. They're looking for smarter choices or at least in their own terms, smarter choices for their for their money. And that is a fundamental change from where we were for dozens of years, which was returns are king. It doesn't really matter too much how I get there. Yeah. And, and so let's go over a couple of uh, a couple of new products that have come out recently that are appealing to uh, millennials uh, vegetarians out there and yep. also you know people who just don't uh, you know with the land use you know reducing land use water use and that's impossible a burger and beyond meat they've been all over the headlines too Absolutely, because I think that younger people are looking for other ways to live out their value. So yeah. they may not have as much investment power. They have some consumer power. There's some debate about how much they're voting their values in terms of stores and, and consumer behavior. But their diet is a very personal choice, you know, and switching to a, a vegetarian dialer or a cutting back on your meat has a profound impact on the planet. It's maybe the only or one of the few individual choices that could trickle out and have this, that kind of uh, cumulative impact. As you mentioned, land use is very inefficient with a lot of uh, cattle production. Water use is difficult. Uh, we have methane issues. And, you know, this is all above and beyond the ethical concerns that some have about that in general. So you hear a lot of uh, millennials looking for meat substitutes, looking to cut back on meat a few days a week, or just other ways to sort of live out their values that are not necessarily tied to investing, but are just as important to them. And and have you had an opportunity to try either one, either the Impossible Burger or the Beyond I've Meat? I've tried them both. Yeah. I've been a vegetarian for 15 years. Oh, I love you. them both. The Impossible Burger is far and away the most convincing uh, non-meat burger that I've ever had. And I defy anybody to try it and not have the same opinion. That's true. Yeah, I've, I've tried both too, and I agree with you. I'm, I, I, I've had a number of Beyond Meat, even la last year, tons of it, we ate a bunch of it. But then I tried the Impossible Burger. I was like, okay, they're getting even closer now. They they're they're, yeah, they're almost it's, it's, there. It was pretty impressive. And and I think the other interesting thing, and this is always when when uh, trends are changing, uh, you're starting to see some of these mainstream restaurants actually sell these products. Like Burger King started doing yeah. that, you know, which is pretty pretty <laughs> incredible. KFC is going to have the the fake chicken McNuggets. I mean, there there's it's going mainstream in a way. And you know, let's not kid ourselves. These are not companies that have come to the light spontaneously. Right. There's a market out there for this. Right. There is a market to serve that they are trying to meet. And now that the technology, at least the food preparation technology, has caught up with what the market demand is, they're finding new new ways to serve that market. And you know, more power to them because uh, I think that people like choice. People like being able to live out their lives in a way that feels authentic yep. and uh, they do that in investing they do that in diet they do that in shopping they do that in a lot of ways so now let's get back to uh, some of the options for retail investors what what can they do uh, to become uh, really start focusing more on some of these companies or even well, uh, or even funds right Right. Funds are always good. In fact, the way most Americans invest now through the retirement fund or 401k, there are many more options now that are sort of fossil free or that are more alternative energy based than there were before. So my guess is that at your workplace, if that's how you do most of your investing, there are options there that would be appealing if you're looking to put these values into effect. Um, we talked a little bit about index inclusion as sort of a cheat sheet for high performing companies, especially the ESG ratings in, uh, indexes. The ESG ratings firms also, you know, rank and rate companies left and right about how, quote, sustainable or, uh, they are. So that's another place where you can get information. Um, I think that I hesitate to tell people to do this, but I think there is great value to be found in individual sustainability reports. Sometimes it can be kind of mind numbing reading these sustainability reports from public companies. But yeah. to me, if this is a value that you want to invest through a lens, then I think that it's almost as important as prospectus because you can look and see uh, what they're doing, uh, how they measure it, how they track it and look for improvement and um, how authentic they are about their commitment to the planet and society. It comes through pretty clearly if you look at those reports. And I know that it's not a fun exercise, but, you know, <laughs> those who are diligent about their money are doing that. Um, there isn't a Cliff Notes version out there for, for those who don't want to go through all those reports. No. The best the best companies do it in short form anyway. The okay. best companies, the reports that you should pay attention to, not a lot of pages, lots of data so that you can actually compare data points. If you're looking at pages and pages of text, 200 pages of photographs and text, yeah. not as decision useful as an investor. 
Now, what about the fees like for some of these funds that offer the ESG option? Do they have higher fees? The, are the management fees any higher than just kind of a more actively managed uh, fund, the normal more actively managed funds out there? Not that I know of. I mean, you were talking about places like Vanguard. They are yeah. the, the high fees are not part of their business plan. So I think that the uh, availability of more options there was mostly based on market and not based on a premium offering for a very small sliver of the of the consumers. I think they're looking at ways to satisfy a growing investor demand, not to sort of uh, placate a very small niche. So let's uh, let's talk about this the the ESG framework because I, I think this is where. Uh, it, it's it's really important, especially, and it appeals really to a lot of our audience here because it it, it really gets down to risk management. You touched on it a little bit before, but it, it's really interesting as as I looked more into this that it, in a way, it helps you avoid a lot of companies that uh, could be a little bit more sketchy or could be hiding things. It's a work in progress. I mean, for as many companies as we unearth using ESG criteria to find out performers. There are always one or two examples where uh, the ESG performance and the ESG rating did not correlate with a corruption scandal or with a, an internal problem or with a, an egregious environmental error. So it's, it's not a perfect science. Right. And we're okay. probably still in this era of trying to figure out which data points really matter. You know, NASDAQ put out this ESG reporting guide where we tried to bubble the universe down into 30 metrics, 10E, 10S, and 10G because we thought that they were fairly um, defensible. They were uh, important no matter how you looked at companies or how broad a view you took about sustainability in general. And, um, you know, they're not always perfect either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a lot of investors that are looking at everything. GRI, for example, is a very broad, very comprehensive sustainability reporting framework that looks at many dozens of uh, metrics across every company. And then on the other side, you've got movements like SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which says, no, for each sector in each industry, I only want to know about four or five or six things that are key to that industry. I don't want to know about everything else. Everything else is useful, but it's not as important to me. So as an investor, you almost have to make a decision which path makes more sense to you. Do you want to know a little bit about every company or do you want to know a lot about a few? And, and so can, can we break down? So, for instance, the, the 10G, 10, 10E that, that, that you were talking about with the NASDAQ, what are some of those metrics that they're looking at there? Well, in the E, it's the obvious things. It's carbon emissions, it's water usage, it's uh, use of renewable fuels, it's uh -huh. uh, do you have an energy management plan in place, yes or no. On the social side, it's a lot of diversity metrics, board diversity, executive diversity, uh, it's labor practices, fair labor practices. And on the G side, it's uh, board management, board transparency, um, you know, whistleblower stuff. So all those things that sort of go into the efficient running of a, of a modern American business, those are all, you know, we think fairly uncontroversial. Uh, there are a lot of ESG metrics that get pretty far afield. One of the things that's interesting about ESG is people tend to throw into ESG everything that's not in the financial report. So uh -huh. if it's not in a 10Q or a 10K, they consider it sustainability or ESG. Uh -huh. And I've seen, I've seen some pretty convoluted arguments for its, for inclusion of some data points. But, you know, I think that it is, you can make sense of it. It's not an easy process. And I think that we're still a little bit of a ways away from people figuring out exactly where the performance levers are. We think that they're, like I said, we've teased at this correlation between a lot of this stuff and, and company outperformance, but we're not exactly sure that X means Y. Now, when, when you say that they're throwing a lot of stuff in, extra in, into the, the reports, do you think there's going to come a point where there might have a little bit more standards there saying, okay, now yeah. these are the only few things. So, so we're still in the early parts of, of this part of the analysis. Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. We've okay. been doing, we've, I've been doing this for 10 years. The exchanges have been in the space for 10 years. You know, yeah. you have SRI and niche investors that have been doing this for 30 years. So, yes, it's it's been a long, um, slow amount of progress, but there has been progress made. And I think that you're exactly right. The harmonization of standards, the agreement among different stakeholders, investors, regulators, and companies in particular, uh, on what is right to disclose and what is overly burdensome. You know, we don't want to create a standard or a default standard that companies, it costs a fortune to produce. Uh, for you know, it, It'll be like diminishing returns over right. time. Right. Uh, right. So I think that we're trying to find that common sense um, middle ground between the everything that most investors want, 
the nothing that companies might want to put out there right. and the something that regulators have determined has has real value. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. Uh, well, considering incorporating the ESG framework into your stock analysis, it could help you focus mainly on quality companies while uh, also helping you manage your risk. Thanks, Evan, for joining us on the podcast today. Where could uh, people learn more about ESG if they want to? It was a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, one place they could go is we just completed a 10 episode series uh, on uh, the NASDAQ podcast called Tomorrow's Capital, available at the iTunes store and every place you can pick up your modern podcasts. And it uh, was an interview series with uh, 10 leading ESG voices in the investment space. So lots of great information there if you want to find out more. Perfect. Coming up next, Justin Nielsen, Director of Research at IBD, is back again. Uh, we're going to talk about the current market and three stocks that have some good ESG qualities. We'll be back. Want to find stocks like the ones on this podcast? A lot of the best names we talk about come from IBD's exclusive stock lists, like the IBD 50 and the Big Cap 20. Whatever type of investor you are, we got a list for you. You can access every one of IBD's lists, plus stock ratings, exclusive analysis, and one-on-one -on -one coaching with a membership to IBD Digital. It costs less than a dollar a day, but for podcast listeners, we're offering an even better price. Go to Investors.com slash podcast offer right now and get your first two months for only $20. We are back on Investing with IBD, and joining us in the studio now is Justin Nielsen. Welcome back, Justin. Thanks, Arusha. Now, Justin, the first question I have for you is, why do you always wear a jacket when you're in the studio? Just to make you look bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very, very effective. Well, it does get cold up here. I mean, for a while, they, were, they called this the freezer. And so I guess I got in the habit of wearing the jacket like on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> Just when I'm getting up here. So now, you never now, know what you're going to get. <laughs> speaking of regular basis, uh, the market, the current market, choppy as all. And so let's get into that first, where... Uh, what's going on with the market right now? Because we're in a confirmed uptrend, but our individual stocks aren't yeah. acting too well. And, and this is where it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at the indexes, it was almost a non-event. Okay, so yeah, you but, had yeah. a couple days that were down, but you know, two days, they weren't down very much. It was a lot of flat action. Um, on Tuesday, the NASDAQ kind of touched its 50-day moving average line, closed above it. And so it was like, ah, you know, if you looked at the indexes, there's nothing to be home. Yeah, there's nothing to be worried about. And then Wednesday here, now it kind of just crossed above that like little area of resistance, and we're back in new high. You know, not new high ground for the year, but uh, new highs in the last couple weeks here. So, again, on the indexes, it's like a non-event. But if you were looking at your portfolio, you might have been like, "What happened?" Because Seriously, if yeah. you had uh, software or you know some of the big growth names, there was this huge sector rotation that was going on, and everyone's talking now about you know, oh, it's value. Value is outperforming for the first time, outperforming growth for the first time since like 2009 or something like that. Uh, if you know. I do a screen like at the beginning of the morning where I just look at what's up the most yeah. for the day. Yep. And that screen has just been filled with things that are below their 200 day moving average lines. You know, so it's it's definitely been not the not the leaders of the past that we're looking at and seeing right now uh, that are working. But, you know, some of the newer names that, you know, maybe were beaten down before that are starting to come back. And so um, the other thing that is important to note is the Russell 2000. You know, through Starting this whole to thing, wake up a little yeah, bit, huh? exactly. You know, yeah. you had flat action in the indexes, except for the Russell. The Russell right. was up one percent, one percent, and then to, on Wednesday it was up two yeah. percent. So the Russell has been kind of showing some strength here as small caps have um, outperformed. Now, granted, the Russell two thousand has a lot of financials. You know, probably like 20 percent, and financials have been an area of a lot of strength. Yeah. So speaking of that, the for our kind of stocks, the IBD fifty mm -hmm. stocks. Uh, there was a lot of damage there. Yes, a absolutely. number of our stocks were down 8%. I 8%, mean, it was like 10%, 15%. Yeah. And it was like, you know, and there was, it was weird because there was like no news that you could point yeah. to. Like it was like, oh, what, what happened? You know, did, you know, did someone, you know, I, I don't know, did the CEO die? Or because right. it was just like, there was no news, right. you know, and it, a lot of these stocks got hit, you know, especially in software. Yeah, so so the key is, you know, you, you make sure that all of the stocks in your portfolio are, are acting healthy. Mm -hmm. If not, 
you know, there are a number of stocks that gave these big warning signs break below the 50 day on heavy yeah. volume. And so you want to protect yourself and then, you know, let the market uh, and the stocks prove themselves again before you start uh, moving in. So if you're listening to the market, if you're in some of our growth stocks, you might have been for you probably were forced more to cash right. on, on Monday, not completely all in cash, but you're probably more in cash. Uh, right now with the way a lot of these and that's an important thing to note is even when we say like okay marketing confirmed uptrend if you're finding stock sell signals on you know on your individual stocks you need to act on that you can't just be saying oh i should be at 100 percent exposure right now and you know i don't see anything else out there so i'm just going to hold everything you know the the benefit of kind of our system is okay if there were stocks that you didn't have much cushion on then you're probably cutting those losses before they got out of hand. Right. If you saw some of the stocks that were previously breaking below their 50-day moving average lines, you were hopefully not sitting with them and getting even further hits um, as as a lot of these stocks were coming in. Right, right, right. So now l- let's get into three current stocks okay, mm-hmm. that, that are holding up pretty well in, in this market. And going along with the theme of this right. episode, uh, these are current stocks that have good ESG qualities. Mm-hmm. And and so how do we know that these stocks have good ESG uh, qualities? Well, we took a look at two indexes, the, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and the NASDAQ Green Economy Index. And we just looked at the holdings for, for these indexes, pulled up the charts, and then, and then just selected three of them. Just as Evan said, it, it makes it really easy on you. That's kind of like self, you know, it's, it's already been screened for you. So, I mean, no matter how you do it, you can just take those names, dump it into Excel, uh, you know, run Oh, what are the composite ratings on these? So yeah. you can use a combination of ratings. Okay, these are pre-screened for the ESG component. Now I'm going to look at, hey, what are their earnings like? What are their you know sales like? All of those things and kind of run it through the can slim uh, gambit. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, so the first stock on uh, for today is Akamai, ticker symbol AKAM. And they're involved in, they're, they've been around for quite a while now. They're involved in network uh, and really making the internet faster for content mm-hmm. delivery. Uh, one e-commerce thing, is a big thing for there. That infrastructure, exactly. That, mm-hmm. But even just video, just, oh yeah, just, video you know, and especially yeah. everyone wants to watch video on their phones and all Absolutely. this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. They're they're involved uh, with, with this. One one interesting thing though in their last quarter is they've had strong sales with their security services. Yes. So they're providing a number of security mm-hmm. options uh, mm-hmm. to that people are taking advantage mm-hmm. of. And that again kind of goes along with that whole infrastructure play that they have. Yes. It should also be noted that they are in the computer software enterprise. Enterprise group, which was a group that got hit very hard, yes. but Akamai didn't really. Yeah, you know, I mean, if, if you look at it, it, it just really didn't show the same kind of destruction that a lot of these other companies were. Um, you know, it's it had a breakout uh, back in July, and it's still kind of holding right above that breakout. It didn't even touch the 50-day moving average line. So again, when you look at a lot of the names in this group, this one is is very different. Yeah, and and this is really uh, not only a breakout over the last year or so out of the real large base, but uh, I just pulled up a monthly chart. Yeah, it, it's uh, you go back to like 2015. It's breaking out of this super kind of large consolidation. Right. Uh, so that's that's really interesting there, and also gives you the perspective that these guys came out during the dot com bust, mm-hmm. and they, you know it's been taking them this long to to recover, but they're 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 continuing to do well, and and so it is pretty significant that they're really into all time well not necessarily all time highs, but they're the highs in the last uh, fifteen years or so. Yeah. On yeah. this one. Uh, so, so right now, they, they, as Justin mentioned, they, they broke out. They are currently 4% uh, from a pivot, uh, which was a cup uh, with the, the pivot point of 86.19. And uh, so they are resisting the, this, uh, this kind of crazy market a lot better uh, than uh, others right here. Yeah. And so if you're looking at a market smith chart, you're going to see that blue band that kind of tells you, oh, 4%, that means you're within that 5% buy zone of you know where we try and get in with the pivot because once you start getting into something that's a lot more extended from that you're more susceptible to to pullbacks and yeah especially in this kind of environment yeah. you know you know yeah it's you you want to be very careful right mm-hmm. you want to be very very selective with both your stocks and how you're buying them uh, and and you definitely don't want to be uh, buying extended here so um, take a look at that that that's one worth uh, investigating uh, further. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second stock on the list is uh, Texas Instruments, ticker symbol TXA. 
N. Yeah. And you know what? The biggest problem I have with this is sometimes I just, I do TNX and all of a sudden I'm looking at the 10 year treasury yield. You know? <laughs> no, because your head shot up right there. And I was like, wait, did I, yeah, right. did I say it right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I had to listen very closely. But yes, it is TXN. That's right. Yeah. And and obviously these are one of the, the granddaddies in the, the semiconductor right. industry. Mm-hmm. And we know the semiconductor industry can be extremely volatile. Yeah. We've seen it over the last year. Yeah. Plus with the whole uh, trade wars going on, right. a lot of these stocks have been crushed during that time. Yeah, it had a strong start to the year, the semiconductors, yes. and then, yeah, this trade stuff started happening, and you know, the back and forth, and optimism, and then, you know, pessimism, hope, despair, <laughs> all of the emotions <laughs> running the gambit, and, uh, you know, but now, uh, even with software getting, you know, kicked quite quite a bit, yeah. uh, semiconductors were very resilient through this, and, and showing a lot of strength and setups. Now, uh, you know, Texas Instruments, they're, they're set to benefit from the 5G, right? 5G demand, that's going to continue to increase. You're, you're going to require more tri- uh, chips. You're going to require all, all this new bandwidth. Yeah. And so um, this is yet another company that's mm-hmm. there. They're going to profit from this really larger trend. And, and so that's one of the newer, exciting parts of, mm-hmm. of their story. And there's always, you know, the way technology goes, there's always something where chips are going to be used you know it's it's yeah. uh, it does go through its cycles of course you know but you know it's it's like there's always something new that uh seem to be getting used where you need a bigger faster not not bigger smaller you know and and, and in most cases a smaller faster um chip that's able to do calculations and everything like that even even faster now now texas instruments is they're they're forming a flat base mm-hmm. right and uh, they found and this is another stock that really didn't wasn't bothered at all on uh on monday they, they just kind of did their thing and uh so found support off the 10 week line on the weekly chart they're forming a flat base and also uh if you're looking at market smith they it's getting the blue dot on the the weekly chart which right which is telling us that the relative strength line is hitting a 52 week high while the stock is building a base mm-hmm. and so it's becoming more of a leader in this market yeah and so we do have um broadcom coming out with earnings so uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure what those came out with, but you know that might be a bellwether for this this industry. So that's something that we'll definitely want to take a look at, uh, you know, as, as soon as those numbers come out. The final stock is Comcast, ticker symbol CMCSA, and uh, Justin, as, as you know, uh, cord cutting has been yeah. happening for a while, right. right? And a lot of these cable companies. We're getting hit naturally because mm-hmm. people are cutting their cable TV. Do, do you have cable TV still? Or? I, I still do. There's okay. uh, certain shows. I, I It's hard, hard we, to replace. We, well, we need to find a – my wife is HGTV like all the time, you know. So, yeah. you know, that's that's something that a lot of – it's a little bit it's more difficult to get that addictive one. Addictive uh, channel for well, sure. Well, it's, it's, it's costly too because yeah. it usually <laughs> means that there's a project she's going to start up. You know, that's, the, that's the problem. She's, she's very, very handy and uh, likes to do projects, and so that can be, uh, that can be a problem. <laughs> So, but but for a lot of other people, they're cutting the cost yes. on, on cable. Yeah. But what's interesting is that uh, a lot of these internet only packages, and uh, I cut I cut the cord mm-hmm. a while back. Uh, but I ha- still I'm dependent on the internet. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've been in, in one of these internet only packages for a long time, and so. The internet packages, only packages, are offsetting yes. the losses that they're seeing right. in cable uh, subscribers running for the hills yeah. right there. Just for an example, in the June quarter, they lost 224,000 video subscribers, yeah. but they gained 209,000 broadband subscribers. And not only that, but the video are low value as opposed to broadband, which is much bigger profit margins. So they're almost at the point where they're kind of like, Eh, let him go. That's you know? true. Yeah, because with video, they would have to pay a lot of fees back right. to the content providers. Mm-hmm. Versus with broadband, they they create the pipeline, mm-hmm. and and they're uh, once again you're going to hit the, the that threshold or the margins just really mm-hmm. grow and grow. Yeah. Not only that, but you also have Comcast potentially getting into the wireless um, mobile market. Yes. You know, wireless phones, yes. yep. and so they're you know they're at, I think at 1.6 million subscribers on the wireless side. So you might start seeing the bundles change yep. instead of your bundling your broadband with your video, you know, and TV and stuff, you might be seeing, oh, now you're bundling your broadband with your your wireless. Perfect. And and one other interesting trend that's happening here, uh, more and more, I don't know if you have this option uh, or if you've seen this option, uh, one gig 
internet uh, service. Mm-hmm. Right. I think my, mine is like a hundred megabytes or something, which is super fast. Yeah. You know? Right. Uh, but now the one gig, which is, <laughs> I can't even. I mean, you, you, you'll you'll be able to watch everything yeah. instantly, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and and multiple places in the house yes, too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those internet packages are becoming more and more available, and they're going to be able to charge a monster price mm-hmm. for those. So those markets are going to increase that mm-hmm. more. Yeah. That much more. And and all of these companies, as you mentioned, they do kind of fit that ESG profile. You know, I know Akamai has an Akamai Foundation where they're getting into um, really kind of encouraging math education for K through 12. Um, you know, Texas Instruments has a lot of sustainability in terms of, you know, sourcing and supply chain management. You know, they have 11,000 suppliers, but... They make sure that you know they're following certain you know policies and corporate you know governance and social and environmental things, and also where they get their materials. You know the mi- the mines. You know staying away from the Congo yeah, and stuff right, like right, that. Right, right. Where you know you've got that what's called conflict uh, conflict metals, conflict minerals, and stuff like that. So again, all of these companies were kind of already pre vetted by those indexes that you mentioned, and. Uh, so you know they're 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 all doing things, and I found that a lot of them have some pretty nice succinct uh, things that their um, their corporate responsibility packages show. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's pretty easy to get through, uh, and and very oh, interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to bore bore people. Yeah, so I, nope. again, just like you know, some some nice nice charts, nice nice graphs, and. Yep. Um, Pretty easy to get through. Now, speaking of charts, the Comcast uh, Comcast chart, uh, they recently broke out of a flat base. They are two percent from their pivot. Yeah, uh, a pivot of forty five thirty. Uh, you know, their their sales, uh, the, their earnings are, are decelerating over the last few quarters. Um, but their sales are, are are decent. But you know, it, we uh, Justin mentioned earlier, there is some kind of there, there's a rotation going yeah. on, mm-hmm. and and so this is the the time where other industry groups are going to start to take the leadership while the the other the the high fly, mm-hmm. flying stocks they they may need a little bit more of a break yeah and you might see some costs go up a little bit you know as they kind of try and get more into that wireless market uh, a lot of marketing spend there um so that that might be affecting things on the short term but could lead to something bigger on the on the long term so there are three companies that uh, are doing well on an ESG framework and uh, thanks, Justin, for joining us once again, only for one segment, but it was a fascinating <laughs> one. Yeah. That's it for this week on Investing with IBD. Next week, we will have market wizard Mark Minervini on the show, and we're going to discuss the market and the mindset you need to become a better investor. So that's it. I'm Arusha Pierce, and thanks for listening. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode.